Would you like to start off with just introducing yourself, telling us a little about your current job, your educational background, a little bit about growing up in Australia, maybe? <laughs> so I'm Jill Taylor, and my current um, job is that I'm a, a senior science advisor at the Association of Public Health Labs. Up until very recently, I was the director of the Wadsworth Centre, which is New York's public health lab. And I retired from that position in uh, late September last year because um, at this stage of my career, I think I have one more adventure in public health left. And so I wanted to take the time to do that. Um, I'm a virologist by training. I uh, grew up in Australia and uh, all my education is in Australia. I have a PhD from the University of Queensland. And I came to uh, the States for the first time in um, 1984, which clearly dates me, um, to learn a technology that was developed in the New York State Department of Health. And I came back several times and um, then I came back for a longer period in 1986, um, just as I was finishing my PhD. And soon after I met an American and got married and the rest is history. And so I've been in the States now for um, over 30 years and I'm a joint uh, US Australian, I have joint US Australian citizenship. So I've always worked in public health, even I did have a period in industry, but it was developing vaccines, which I consider public health, um, one aspect of public health. So I've Absolutely. worked in public health my entire career and it's my passion. It, it is something I just love to be involved in. And while I'm not at the bench anymore, I um, am doing uh, public health at a, a very high level and really enjoying it. Your passion really shows. Thank you. <laughs> um, so to get started with the questions, can you please give us a quick rundown of your previous role as the director of the Wadsworth Center and maybe a little bit about the center itself and what it is? Mm -hmm. Wadsworth is New York's public health lab and every state in the country has a public health lab. That's as far as the similarities go really because every public health lab is, is quite different because every state is different and so mm -hmm. the lab serves the needs of the state. Wadsworth is uh, one of the largest public health labs in the country. I think California is, is bigger but we're quite unique in that we not only do public health but we have um, externally funded, federally funded research there as well into health related um, questions. And we also have a regulatory program so that we regulate uh, labs that do testing um, for New York citizens. We have an educational program. So it's kind of, what's with this kind of like a mini FDA, mini CDC, mini um, USDA, many, all sorts of federal agencies all rolled into one. So it's a really fascinating um, organization. We're, we're, we're what's called a reference lab in that we don't do the sort of testing that clinical labs in hospitals mm -hmm. or commercial labs do. We do the testing that they can't do for technical reasons or biosafety, biosecurity reasons, or that. Um, that there's not enough of a market. So we do testing for rare diseases. We do uh, or testing for babies in newborn screening, but many public health labs do that. And in Wadsworth, we test about 240,000 babies every year. Wow. 50 different conditions. So that's probably our biggest high throughput program. Fascinating program. I can um, imagine. You know, we deal with outbreaks, so measles, Zika, pandemic flu. Um, we deal with public health emergencies, um, problems with Legionella, um, outbreaks of um, microcystins in water, things like that. So now we're sort of at the end of the finish line, or looks like it, with COVID-19. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I really hope so. It's had a big impact on the way we lead our lives. So in your opinion, 
what does the future of public health look like post COVID-19 for like students or kids in college right now who want to pursue public health? How do you see the field altered by this in the future? Mm, that's a really great question. And, and that's actually the sort of thing that I'm working on now at APHL. You know, I think that um, public health has always been underfunded. The, the interesting thing about public health is that we're successful when nobody knows about us because we prevent problems and solve problems before they become problems. Um, but it's chronically underfunded. And I think that, you know, we all lived in a bit of a bubble in that there's been a lot of talk about pandemics for years. I think we all thought it was going to be influenza. The need for a strong public health infrastructure has become apparent to a lot of people, including the federal government. And President Biden clearly gets that because there's a lot of money for public health in his rescue plan. Not only technologies like sequencing, mm -hmm. but um, the public health infrastructure, the workforce, the training, the data. And so I, while you can't see anything good about a pandemic, you know, from one perspective, the realization that public health is important in all our lives in terms of preparedness, um, the fact that that awareness has been raised is a good thing. And so, you know, for kids coming through school now who are interested in science careers, really wonderful place, wonderful time to get into it. And so many fascinating things to work on and solve problems, yes. That's really reassuring to hear for myself and all others who are interested. Yeah. So yeah. you have had this really important position in a really important lab doing incredible work for so long. So if you could go back and look at your high school self or your college self or maybe your early career self, what is one piece of advice you'd give? I had no idea what I wanted to do when I left school. Um, I, I had some sense of what I didn't want to do but not what I wanted to do. And so, you know, when I look back, um, I took all sorts of different paths and, opened, and went through doors that were open. And this is where I ended up. My husband in other, uh, on the other side is a virologist, just like I am. And he went from high school to a bachelor's degree, to a PhD degree, to a postdoc, to a job. He went, Completely. All laid out. And whereas I went left, right, left, right, left, right. Look carefully at doors that open because they may be just what you're looking for and do the right thing. Just keep doing the right thing and everything will be fine in the end. What is one skill that you find yourself using on a daily basis that you would recommend others who are interested in public health or just as a rule of life to learn? Listen. Listen, Listen, you know, we all, we all multitask now and um, we miss so much and we don't, I think it's important to have, especially as a scientist, to have real conversations back and forth, you know, really debating in a respectful way but of getting course. to the important subjects of life. But it's got to be between people who listen to each other. You know, too many times, and I find myself doing this, you're, you're formulating your own answer while the other person is speaking. And um, I wish I didn't do that. Um, so I, listen, I think. You learn so much. And um, it's just a, it's a skill, I think, that you have to learn. Yeah rolling here of how did you choose this career path like you mentioned that you weren't sure of what you were going to do when you were going to do it but now this is your passion this is your life how did you figure out that this is what it was for you so my observation is that I think as I mentioned before some people like a light bulb goes off in their head and they say, I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to be a lawyer or, you know, I'm going to be a firefighter or I'm going to, and they know, and I had no clue, but I was working on um, developing recombinant vaccines mm -hmm. and um, 
I enjoyed that and that's and I worked in industry for about 10 years on that and one of the um, vaccines that we were making was a recombinant vaccine for measles and so I started reading a lot about measles how um, it's virtually eliminated in the United States but in some countries of the world it still kills many many babies every year and you know we never in in the US in Australia you don't think about measles as a killer but it, it actually is and so I started reading a lot more and when I was in industry also um, you know it's very profit driven and so there was not a lot of um, sort of leeway on the edges to do other things. And so I went and talked to the director of the Wadsworth Centre about potential positions. And he said, well, we do have a position. And um, I came to the Wadsworth Centre uh, to develop a, a program in HIV drug resistance. And that was just at the time that antiretrovirals were coming out, but also we were discovering, discovering that um, you develop resistance to antiretrovirals very quickly. And so we set up a lab at the Wadsworth Center doing genotyping of HIV from, from clients, looking at which drugs they were resistant to, and which ones they were sensitive to, so that physicians could um, prescribe the right one. And it was set up as a clinical trial because, and I love this story, um, it was set up as a clinical trial because at that point it wasn't drug resistance, genotyping wasn't reimbursed by health insurance. So we set it up as a clinical trial so that patients could enroll in the clinical trial, get the genotyping for free, and you know we were able to offer it to New York State residents. And then, um, so I did that for a couple of years and um, I'd never worked in HIV before. I'd never run a clinical trial before, but you know, we figured out how to do it. And then um, uh, uh, genotyping became um, reimbursable by health insurance. And so there really wasn't any point in continuing the clinical trial. And the director came mm -hmm. to me and said, Jill, um, we have a really good clin uh, clinical virology lab, but it's very um, traditional, very much based in culture and culture of viruses, which is a very poor method of isolating and diagnosing um, pathogens. And we really need to be much more molecular. So would you come and turn it into a molecular lab? And so I did that for a Your couple of Your task was revolutionizing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did that for a couple of years and I actually hired somebody who was a clinical virologist who was much more experienced than I was, but I started the, the process. And then the director came to me one day and said, Jill, I have a new assignment for you, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> and so he left me in the dark for about six weeks. And then it turned out that the deputy director of the lab was retiring and he wanted to, me to be the deputy director, which was fabulous. And I did that for about seven years before I became the director. And so it's all just happened. You know, I could never have imagined that I would be director of a lab like the Wadsworth Centre, which is really quite a famous lab in the, in the um, country. And... Um, it's, it's funny, all the previous directors since um, the lab was founded in um, about 1901 have all been men and have all been MDs. And so I'm the first woman and the first PhD. That so is I incredible. Broke, I broke a glass ceiling. You um, broke a glass is, ceiling. I did. I did. Um, but I could never have imagined it. So, you know, when you say, how did this happen? It just happened. The pieces fall into place. Yeah, you know, and I think that's where I come to look carefully at open doors, even if they're scary and you think, hmm, can I do that? Look carefully. So yeah. you just let us know that you broke a glass ceiling. You're the first woman to hold this position ever in history. 
when you were going through like all this process, how did, I'll phrase it as a workplace sexism, how did that deter you? Did you ever come into contact with that? Like, do you have any strategies to just ignore and push past, speak up if something's happening? Um, push past it. I mean, I think that my son will never be sexist. Your children will not be sexist. I think we're growing out of it. We're clearly going through a period now with the Me Too um, campaign and, you know, as you know, in New York with Governor Cuomo. And I think it's something that we have to, as a society, understand that that's unacceptable behaviour and that we're all equal and we, are need, we need to be respected and we need to move on. Um, I am a lucky woman in that I have never been harassed or had to deal with that situation. Um, but boy, I've worked hard. I, and you, 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 oh. you, you work hard and you do it and you keep going. Yeah. That's a great way to look at it. So a little <laughs> off topic, but yeah. you mentioned that you have a son and that your husband is a virologist also. Does your yeah. son share your scientific views? <laughs> like, was it a no. too much pressure having such a smart mother? <laughs> no. um, my, our son is very smart, but he's a film producer. There was just wow. too much science at the dinner table. <laughs> Tom, there was no way he was going to be a scientist. He went all, all the way yeah. off to the other end. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I have great hopes for his daughter, Rosie. Yeah, Rosie as all the making of a scientist or an engineer. Already putting the early influences on. Yeah, you bet, you bet. We bought a binoculars for Christmas and the next thing will be a microscope. And yeah. Aww. What's more important than the role of women in science except to support other women, women in science? In science, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, so also just talking about your research, you mentioned that you were doing work with recombinant vaccines back when you first started. So mm -hmm. can you just really quickly go over your thoughts on the three different vaccines that are coming out now? Like mm -hmm. I know a lot of people and a lot of people are very supportive of Johnson and Johnson because it's supposedly only one dose and that's mm -hmm. it. But in the initial stages, Johnson and Johnson wasn't showing like the best numbers and mm -hmm. effect uh, effects in being effective. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so, you know, the first thing is, if you're offered a vaccine, take it, no matter which yeah. one it is, yeah. because they all protect against death and hospitalization. And that's the major thing. You know, with COVID-19, there's so much we don't know. I mean, um, I've been vaccinated now and I got Pfizer, um, but we have no idea, and this is a, totally new technology that's never been in humans before. So we have no idea how long the, the immunity is going to last. There's so much we have to learn. Um, but, they, but the beauty of what's happened is, and it's a lesson in here, that work on using RNA as vaccines mm -hmm. was done at the NIH on using public funds. And so it just shows, and if that work hadn't be done, we'd be in a really terrible place right now because to make a, a normal vaccine takes a long time. And that was done so quickly and they're already working on potential vaccines for the variants. So that just shows you how important it is to keep funding research. Um, and this is just an absolute marvel. And when I got the vaccine, I felt like I'd been given a gift. Um, really? It was, it was really such a joy. Um, yeah, so if you can get the vaccine, take it. But my we've got a lot to learn. My parents actually, my mother got Moderna and so did her mom. And then my dad got Pfizer. 
So we're joking that it's her little science experiment. See yes, who, yes. Which one works out? <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Did your mom have any adverse reactions? No, we got, we were very lucky as in it wasn't that bad. My grandma, she did have a fever, but it was like yeah. a one day pass. Uh, but yeah. I saw that some people were having the arm yeah. reaction, like the fever yeah. also. And one day flu, you know, yeah. so the next day I had absolutely nothing. So yeah. um, I was incredibly lucky. Yeah. The media, I feel like demonizes it so much because even before my parents got a vaccine, they were in this mindset that, oh, when the second dose comes, like, that's it. Like, I'm going to be in bed for a week, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. dying. We'll see if I make <laughs> it. And it's like, I don't know, guys. Like, a lot of people are getting this. It seems okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was funny when I, I, I had a sort of light workload the, the, day, the, the day after. And I planned a light that workload. But I sort of was sitting, well, come on, here they come. You know, where's the fever? Where's the fever? Exactly. Did they give me the placebo? <laughs> It's like, yeah. I'm, I'm supposed to be dying right now. Everything yeah. feels okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. But we got, I, you know, it's really hard to, mes me to message to the public because I think they want science to be black and white. And it isn't black and white. It's, you know, everything we do, there's a risk. And in this, the, the risk is that we just ha don't have all the knowledge that we'll have in five years time. Um, but, but there's so few guarantees and it's very hard to message that about science because the knowledge keeps growing. So, you know, I know the facts today, but those facts are going to change in a week's time. Um, and that's a hard concept to get across to someone that's not used to that. Yeah. yeah. So we, we need to get better at that. Even when the vaccines originally came out, people were so terrified of it. The rhetoric was along the lines of, oh, all other vaccines took decades of like work to do. How do they get this out so quickly? But when you think about it, if the entire scientific community, as you said, like that's the great thing about science, it's a community. If everyone's working on one thing, trying to push forward this vaccine, and the technology that we have today is something they didn't have when they were making the measles vaccine, That's right. when they were making That's the right. flu shot. So yeah. five years from now, we probably will have something different. But for now, based on this what we what have, this yes. is what we've got. Yeah, use the tools we have. That's exactly. right. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, when you think about um, this technology, it opens a door to me to better flu vaccines which can be adjusted quickly for the variants that are circulating. And that's always been a huge, in many ways, flu vaccines are a public health failure. We, we've never solved that problem. And, you know, a lot of people die, elderly people die of flu every year. So that's a, a problem that's that we statistical. still have to solve. Yeah. There you go, Abby, there's still, there's something that you could work on. There's still something to do. Did we, do you feel like we just became complacent with the flu vaccine? Like, the, the, this is what we have now. We take it once a year. It's not that big of a deal. Or do you think that there's still people who are, like, spearheading, trying to figure out how to get this one and done? There's an enormous amount of research um, trying to find a flu vaccine that'll cover all strains that... Um, even when the virus varies, it's comprehensive enough that um, it doesn't have to be altered. It hasn't succeeded yet, but there's a lot of work going into that. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. Mm. This is everywhere, every single year. Mm, that's right. That's right. And of course, we worry about flu pandemics. I mean, with the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, we really missed a bullet dodged a bullet because that was not a highly pathogenic virus and we we're incredibly lucky but uh, yeah as you mentioned your lab you guys were discussing how you were expecting a pandemic how this was something that you didn't predict obviously the scale of this is something no one could predict but you were aware that something could happen is it based on just the idea that variants can pop up anywhere for anything and we're just not prepared to deal with them until later on? And it's not only the variants pop up, um, the fact that our 
uh, human communities are much closer to the forest and the animal communities and avians. Um, think about mixing of avians and pigs in China, you know, because our population has grown so greatly, um, the potential for mixing of variants in a host to create a new virus is so much higher. Think about Ebola and how this Ebola outbreaks now because the humans and the, um, the bats and the um, bushmeat are so much closer together. Um, this is, there's a lot more emerging diseases. Think of SARS in 2003, the original SARS. Um, this is going to happen again. Yeah. Hopefully we learn a little something every time. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. But there's plenty for kids who are interested in science. There's plenty of careers. Really, there are. Definitely. That's one of the, my big takeaways from this. There's just so much that public health touches that you can really look anywhere and you'll find something for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much again for going a little more in depth and having this conversation. It oh, was an my honor. pleasure. <laughs> oh, it's great to talk to you, Abby. You take care. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Bill. Bye. Bye.